Are you a business owner looking for real advice and input? You're in the right place. From concept to launch to growth, funding and beyond. Welcome to Startup Hustle with your hosts. One once sold a business for $150 million. The other, the author of Million Dollar Bedroom. Here are your hosts of Startup Hustle, Matt DeCourcy and Matt Watson. And we're back. Another episode of Startup Hustle. Matt DeCourcy here with Matt Watson. Hi, Matt. How's it going, man? I know. I know you're feeling down today, aren't you? Um, it's not good. I'm feeling I mean, a little sick. I know not only, and we're going to get into that, but I'm man, down. Is part, of why you're, is part of why you're down due to the fact that your tour bus got repossessed? Yeah. I'm also taking these green M&Ms back. Oh, my God. For those of you listening, you're probably wondering why. As most of you know, as we entered the charts for business podcasts on Apple, Matt got real rock star on us. I see a gold money gun here. I'm going to have to send it back. Your tour bus has been repossessed. I'm going to eat your green M&Ms during this episode. You're God. no longer listed on the charts. Do you know why? Why? The, they killed the charts. There's it no doesn't, chart? It doesn't even exist. Apple, oh, like, literally... God destroyed the chart we're not a top 100 business podcast because no one is no oh, one man. is literally no one is we have been forced back into obscurity there was no way to predict this I had How, good news it, it, you're saving a bunch of no, money on your news. tour bus insurance? we are now a top 10 business podcast yeah sure prove we, it just make it up i prove know it. i know i know so well <laughs> unfortunately there was really no way to predict that apple was going to remove no. the entire business I think they helped us because now we're a top 10 podcast. I think we actually are top three. Top three? All yeah. Right. And, you know, the thing is, is there's actually no data to truly support this. Yeah. Now, and that's what we're going to talk about. So I've brought in someone to help predict. I, they can help me and us understand when you're going to feel sick. I can't, however, do much to figure out when your stuff's going to get repoed. I can All also right. predict that I'm going to eat. Here's your green m and yeah, that's it, dude. Let's rub it, it in. It was a, it, hopefully yeah. you enjoyed it while it lasted. Anyway, today we have Graham Dodge, who's the co-founder and the CEO of Sick Weather, with us today. Hi, Graham. Hi, Matt. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you coming in. You're going to help us work through the data science of a lot of different things today, um, and that's our topic: data science. What is it? How do we use it? How does Apply to you. I think we've talked about some of this before, but Graham, you know a couple things. So tell us about sick weather before we get started. So sick weather is like a Doppler radar for sickness. That's why we're called sick weather. That's the that's the meaning of the name there. And what we're doing is we're listening to social media, uh, public reports of people talking about symptoms of illness that we're able to track, and then we can sort of model and predict you know what's going to happen next because of understanding you know how those specific illnesses spread um and uh we've been doing this since about 2011 and we now power the weather cha weather channels cold and flu maps which has an audience of about 10 million daily active users wow that's a lot yeah so so did you say but you that's that's actually one million more than maybe <laughs> listening to this podcast right now right Matt? yeah because the data supports uh-huh yeah, because we're a top three podcast. So, so you're saying you did you say you uh, collect data from like Twitter and stuff like that, just looking for when people say they're sick? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. So they use that info, and like the question is, is you know everyone's always talking about data, 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 data. It's either being breached or it's being collected or like Siri's listening to me or Facebook's talking to you or, you know, like, I mean, so what happens with all this data? And it's been a big topic. So it's, I mean, literally a whole entire field of science has, has come up and that's data science. And you know a couple of things about that, right, Graham? That's right. I mean, that's basically our platform to our enterprise customers is all based on our ability to model the data and, and create predictive analytics. Is that the definition when we say what is data science? It's not not really. I mean data well, then science. What is data science? Right. Data science is the science of collecting and understanding the data and what it means and how it applies to different, you know, trends and in our case different verticals um, that are, you know, uh, you know, we're able to use the data that we collect to help inform everything from ad campaigns for pharmaceutical companies to supply chain decisions to HR decisions. 
Matt, do you think that Stackify does data science in some regard? Because you guys collect a ton of data too, right? Like we you we collect a lot of data for sure. Um, we don't currently do a lot of machine learning and stuff like that, but we definitely provide a lot of um, a lot of data reporting on data analytics. I mean, if we look at science, science is, is experimentation and often... I mean, depending on what your intention is with the result, you are going through a process in a repeated and and calculated way to try to measure what a result is. Is that somewhat close? That's right. And and typically, yes. you know, a data scientist is going to be looking at things like the R squared value of two different data sets and how they correlate, you know, and then you get into the whole discussion of causation versus correlation and Things like that are, are primarily what's studied in data science before you get into the you know predictive modeling of it. He lost me at R squared, <laughs> stuff like that. But yeah, and so that's some. I mean, that's smart people stuff. I mean, for, for we have real, people at full scale to do this. Yeah, no, I get we it. Do. Yeah, and and you know, so with that, and by the way, if you want to check out what Matt and I do, go to fullscale.io. Thanks, Matt. Um, but data is such a a, to a popular topic, and there's so much of it being collected. I talk to a lot of people, Grandma was telling you before we started the episode, I talk to a lot of people, uh, I mean, largely our incoming or current clients at full scale, and they're talking, they're always like, hey, I bet I collect all this data, but no one really seems to know what the hell to do with it or why it's valuable. I openly admit I'm kind of clueless. I understand in some cases why specific types of data is valuable, but it seems like there's just this broad stretch where everyone's in this massive data grab and they're trying to collect anything and everything possible. But it feels like in the end, it, so much of it just comes back to helping people sell stuff. Yeah, it does. Is and that, that would, really what drives all of it? Oh, absolutely. Um, advertising, you know, and marketing. Um, most of the data, when people talk about having data or collecting data, they're talking about user data, they're talking about... Um, uh, you know, knowing where someone shops, you yeah. know, and how many kids they have and, you know, things like that. Uh, other demographics about them that can be used to filter and sort of strategize ad campaigns to market things towards them. And that just creates a, a better sense of targeting. It removes redundancies, stuff like that, I well, guess. What's, right? what's crazy about advertising is usually like one in a thousand people will click on an ad, right? Yeah. So if you can do better targeting and you get right. like three out of a thousand, like you are killing it. You're kicking ass. Like it's amazing what little difference that makes, but and one it of makes the, a big difference. One of the big, I think, key differences between what we do and what others are doing to collect data is that we're actually publishing it for consumers to see directly as well. Right. You know, so inherent to what we're tracking, we knew right away when we started the company Th these are data that um, uh, that consumers can also benefit from having a access to. You know, someone who yeah. com has a compromised immune system wants to know what's trending in their area in terms of sicknesses. Someone who's a parent with a, a you know newborn baby is going to want to know. Um, and so we made that available to consumers first and foremost. And by doing so, we were actually way ahead of these sort of GDPR. Um, privacy regulation. Be, be careful, you're going to get Watson worked into a frenzy. If you say GDPR <laughs> too many times, you get maybe three times, so that's that's one. Yeah, but yeah. If you say it twice more, and I said it again. So and then I'll go crouching tiger hidden Watson on you. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. And by the way, that's there's no data to support what could happen when, yeah. that, when that lines up. But yeah, all right, sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Well, and that, I mean, that was basically it, just to sort of differentiate, like, you know, you're talking about what do people do with the data? You know, are they just selling it to target ad campaigns? And yeah, that's true. There are very few companies who take the data and then give it back to the public. And that was something that we did early on that differentiated, you know, how we built our business and why we're now like a consumer facing brand that's powering these maps with the weather channel as well. I see those. I, I honestly, until today, I had no clue that, that, that your platform is driving that. Uh, because we like you to be interactive while you're listening, you can go to sickweather.com and check it out and just kind of see what's up. Um, you guys have a consumer app. You have a web platform that's largely enterprise. That's and right. you have APIs that send all kinds of stuff in and out. Think about that, man. 10 million people uh, seeing your stuff every day. Hello. 
Yeah. That's oh, pretty no, awesome. The data's in. We're actually up to 10 million and one listeners. Oh, when I meet people and they ask what I do and I explain what sick weather is, they go, oh, I've seen something like that on the Weather Channel. I'm like, yeah, that's my company. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know who I am or my company's name, but they've seen it on any, the Weather Channel. Any idea what percentage of um, reported sicknesses you guys think you get? So for every five people that say they have the flu on Twitter, is there really like a thousand or any idea? Oh, you're getting into some real theoretical stuff. I mean, is that part of your model, though? Is that kind of stuff? Uh, yeah, well, what, what exactly, like, it, it, within the context of what you can talk about? Because yeah. you actually have several patents. I saw an article recently talking about that. Right. And you've gone through a whole lot of that. But, like, ex- give, us a, give us a rundown. Like, what are you collecting? Because I would think that some of that info is also, like, public health records, too. But Well, that's sort of public health records. Um, there's not really such thing as a public health record. There are health records mm. and things like that. And then there's public health data, gotcha. which is what the CDC collects and publishes. But uh, what our patent covers is the process of using social listening to do disease surveillance, essentially, that whole process, uh, and, and mapping it and geolocating it and, and forecasting it. Are you the only company that does it? Uh, we're the only company that does that with the social listening data. Yeah, okay. That's right, yeah. So if I'm on Twitter and I'm like, man, I feel like shit today, you guys hear that. Right. There's a, there are ways that we can qualify that statement in so many words. Yeah. I see. You look like shit all the time. I know. That's why sick weather usually passes right over most of my social media. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and Matt was saying, Watson was saying that he was having a bit of a stomach bug. Right? Yeah, he I got a stomach virus. And I looked at the sick weather app real quick just to it did it just see. show his face? Is there like a, a Watson <laughs> emoji like on the Kansas City? I have map? not tweeted about it. <laughs> it told so, me to take uh, three steps back. No, yeah, but dude, it, it, sick weather knows everything. Man. Yeah. They figured it out. Well, and it, and it shows food poisoning. It's like Kansas Facebook City. and Google. Is it listening on my phone too? Uh, no, but we can talk <laughs> about that. There, yeah. there are things that do that, certainly. Yeah. And, it's, and it's, I've seen a few times in life now where it's like super creepy. You're talking to somebody yep. about something, and the next ad you see is like, direct what that thing was and you're like what well and that's because you have a mobile advertising id and a mobile equipment id that is being tracked by the advertisers and the companies that are buying and selling those data and they're constantly compiling you know who you know what are your interests based on those ids i'm so scared to know what my profile looks like well, I'm just cause. I mean, for real, I'm like shit. Like you think about it, like shop. You, I mean, it's just stuff. like anything, you know. Lots like, of ads for money guns. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, and in that data, in data science, there's the concern of always creating these feedback loops based on that kind of information. You know, like uh, you constantly being targeted for green M&Ms, mm-hmm. you know, because yep, yep, yep. at one point it got tracked that you liked green M&Ms and now you can't get, you know, you can't get out of that even do though you, you might not like them anymore. Do you guys do this outside of the United States? We do. Yeah. So we're not restricted by any kind of political boundaries, so to speak, or geography, just by language and, you know, social media habits and how people talk about. So do you only sick. do English? No, we started off doing English, but now we do about uh, seven, eight different languages. Okay. Yeah. And so we're entering Latin American markets. We're entering, you know, Paci- you know, Southeast Pacific markets, uh, Southeast Asian markets, um, and we've been providing these types of t- surveillance for European countries for our customers. Okay. Our enterprise customers. Okay, so we have a basic idea of the, in regards to sick weather, and how you guys collect data, and we understand that, you know, like, thank you for powering the Weather Channel. By the way, that's like super useful because I don't know, man. Ever since I had kids. They're just always sick. I mean, they're just like, just transporting disease. You know, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I, I never, I never used to get sick, and then I had kids, and it's like once a month. I'm like, yeah. wow, okay. So that ball pit. <laughs> Does sick weather actually have sensors in the ball pits around <laughs> everywhere? Because I feel like that is the epicenter of germs and disease for pretty much the world. Yeah, I'm writing that idea down now. That's I think you should. Idea. I mean, for real. Like, <laughs> if we could just measure that. Okay. All, right. All right. So, knowing that a lot of the people that are listening um, have startups or businesses or want to that deal with different types of data. Let's talk about how you monetize it. Like yeah. we understand that on a, on a high level that um, it drives a lot of advertising and just different stuff. I mean, it makes sense. Like, you know, so if you're, uh, if you're uh, the maker of NyQuil and that's cough medicine or something and, you don't, and all of a sudden the shelves are empty, opportunity cost. 
and or whatever and that makes it that makes a big difference so obviously trying to plan for that on some of it it's act this is actually really good like sick weather is really good public service because if you want to go get that and it's gone i would imagine that's also not helpful but how how do you how do you monetize data if you're looking at any platform that you own and you're like how do i do something with this like what are what are your options like where do you go from there well, like most things, the more you process it, the more value you create. So explain. Well, like raw data of people just talking about being sick, you know, right now or yesterday, whenever, is only worth so much to a customer who really wants to know what's going to happen 15 weeks from now. Um, so when we first started, we were, you know, monetizing the raw data, so to speak, meaning the data of people who we've already qualified the reports uh, of them talking about being sick. Um, so, and, and it's even, it, there's are, there are more raw for, forms of it, you know, that aren't, you know, already processed that way. Uh, but that's sort of our basic product is just, you know, you know, you can access our API if you're a developer to find out how many people are talking about flu right now in Kansas City, for example, or over the past two weeks. That's only worth so much to our pharmaceutical customers and the ad agencies because that is, you know, it's today and it's yesterday, but what about decision making that can be powered by knowing what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, or 15 weeks from now. And that's where the value starts to shoot up. The more you start impacting strategic decision making at these sort of higher levels when it comes to supply chain, when it comes to marketing, merchandising. Where do you go to sell this stuff? I mean, are there literally data marketplaces and like brokers and like, I mean, so... I, here I am, I'm sitting on this mountain of data and I'm, I'm processing it. Now what? I mean, right. do they typically approach you? Do you have to like, how, do you, how, I mean, how did you do it or well, how should you do it? Yeah, I mean, that's a whole other t issue in terms of how to unlock your data, how to publish it in a right. format that people can ingest. Or even find someone that's willing to buy it. I right. mean, so this data is really valuable. It's only valuable if you have someone ready and willing to write you a check, right? Uh, or, or subscribe to your API or do something, right? Yeah, and in our case, that tends to be the pharmaceutical companies and their ad agencies. Um, so, okay. so, so an ad agency is a good good place to start. It is, and they're the ones really driving some of the data markets um, with companies like Axiom and LiveRamp, where they go to these larger platforms that are consolidating. You know, if you've got an app on the market and you're collecting user data, you can sell those data to Axiom mm -hmm. through LiveRamp and that'll take care of it. But now you're just selling user data. You're not modeling it. So you're not creating as much value out of the data as you could be. But that is a place, that is a marketplace to your question, like where do you go to sell it? Or what you can do, which is what we did, which is create your own API, create your own you know, platform that visualizes the data for your customers and takes a lot of that guesswork out of it. So the more work you can do for them to understand the data and, and to understand what decisions can be made from it, the more value you'll be able to, you know, the more you'll be able to charge for it. When you're talking about modeling the data and getting it prepped, you know, you're getting it all dressed up for the dance, is there a, like, uh, is there a universal format or like do all these places kind of want it in the same kind of way or, I mean, because, you know, when I'm sitting here thinking about the data and you're talking about modeling it, I'm thinking, you know, back to the days when you could upload a file, like an Excel file or something, and you're like, okay, it's, sorry, it's not in the right order. You need to put the address column over to the left one or it won't match. I mean, is, it, is that how that works? Or It's funny. Uh, one of my first uh, mentors, advisors, worked, she had owned a company that um, found a company that was all about um, understanding, you know, trends on the Internet just in general. And I was so fascinated by, like, how do you sell that data? Like, what format? How do you publish it? She sent me an example of it, and it was an Excel spreadsheet with yeah. <laughs> like a logo on it. I was yeah. like, wow, that's it? It's that simple? But um, no, these days, and this, this, that was probably eight years ago, but these days, uh, you know, the customers are a little bit more sophisticated. They're used to sort of these SaaS dashboards, you know, that they can log into, and they can see the graphs, and they look really pretty. So you do have, you know, that kind of expectation in the market. Okay. In terms of developers, though, as long as you have documentation and you have the API available to them and you can, you know, answer questions or you, you fork it on GitHub or whatever you're doing, you know, that these are things that um, the developers don't need quite as many bells and whistles if you're working directly with them. And the answer always is it depends, right? Like, if you're a weather.com, weather channel or whatever, and you need to access your API 10 million times a day, 
I'm going to guess they don't really want to do that. I'm going to guess they want a copy of the data in their data center, and they can just query that data locally. So then potentially you have to syndicate that data and copy it over to them and figure out how to do all of that. And Right. But for a little, but for somebody small, like I just want to access the data a thousand times a day. You don't want to deal with syndicating all of that. So, it there's never a one size fits all to these problems. So when it's I, a scale problem. I, I I had my first exposure to this kind of stuff. Um, it was at this point three years ago. I went to TechCrunch out in San Francisco. I think it was 2016, and I was going and I was trying to figure out. It was I, at that point we hadn't started full scale. This podcast didn't exist. It, didn't exist and I was trying to figure out what I what I wanted to do with Gigabook our booking platform and I and I've always felt like it would be the good other side of an equal sign so here's someone that collects data and but it's only worth something if it's actionable and I was literally out there you know so one thing I think if you have a startup or you're trying to monetize stuff and with if whatever you do if it's really easy for anyone to say and then then you aren't completing that sales equation. And I was literally talking to someone that had a startup that was social listening. They mm-hmm. were, um, I'll give you the example, they were looking for people on Twitter that, this is not the real example, we're looking for people on Twitter that say they want, they need a haircut. And so at that point, you, okay, that, and they would say that. They'd be like, and we were able to identify people on Twitter that are saying this. And I'm like, and then? Because that data is not worth crap. But if all of a sudden you can use it to fill up barber chairs mm-hmm. everywhere, now all of a sudden it takes on a whole different life of, of, of value and convenience and whatever. So how do you complete that sales equation? Mm-hmm. And I think that sounds like that's still the problem or the issue that, I mean, I'm sure there's people that are truly scientists at that as well. But It's the problem with data in general though, right? I mean, it's yeah. one thing to have a lot of data if you don't, have like a real use for it but that's we've a talked about this at, we, we, so we've talked about this at full scale as well so like one of the ways that you talk about like in a way like social listening but companies that are posting ads online for software developers clearly are are possibly in need of our service yeah. mm-hmm. so we actually created some data collection tools and then all of a sudden we end up with eight thousand <laughs> lines of data and we're like oh wow Okay. Everybody, everybody's hiring. This is awesome. So now we've got <laughs> eight thousand lines of data with eight thousand different job postings and companies. Now what? Yeah, right. And it's back to that, like at, you know, essentially so, the data is completely useless at that point. Well, it, 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 it is because well, it is and it isn't. But how quickly can you reply or respond to some of that right. and take an actionable approach and like what which ones are more valuable and how do you how do you I don't know like so you kind of look at it and sometimes you collect it and then you're like oh shit like I've got a lot of data here so um, obviously the the way you model it um, is important now I think it, what we should talk about for a second is like how to collect it and what or what you shouldn't collect are you, it, wait, well <laughs> are you Watson's got the gold money gun, which, by the way, which, by the way, is apparently just a red money gun that someone painted gold. Dude, it's got way more horsepower than the other one. Yeah, but like data, they paint it gold. Now it's worth more. Yeah, they they process. Yeah, now well, I know because I bought the exact same thing. I'm like, wow. So that's like the exact same thing. We'll get. Yeah, hey, give that back. Well, in terms of, you haven't earned this yet. All right. In so. terms of collecting it, I mean, um, you're, you're getting down to the world of APIs and developer application programming interfaces uh, that developers can use to access data. Generally speaking, I mean, for us, we're dependent on the real-time census that is social media. You know, if it wasn't okay. for the advent of social media, we wouldn't exist. Is um, that where you collect the majority of your data? That's right. Yeah, okay. so we're collecting most of our data these days just on Twitter. Uh, and then we also have people self-reporting through our own consumer app, which okay. has become like a Waze app for sickness, essentially. Uh, and then people can also report you know, on the Weather Channel app as well. So that's our business is getting that kind of, you know, we're trying to get that, the point of incidence for these sort of health events down to the person, down to the latitude and longitude <coughs> of where it's been reported. So those are the things that we care about, and then we can reverse geolocate, for example, to a zip code or a city to be able to understand what the trends are at that location. What kind of data should you not be collecting, though? Because there's some uh, on some mm-hmm. levels, like well, whether it's based on whether it's just not ethical or even illegal. 
Mm -hmm. Is it illegal to collect certain types of data? Like I would imagine that collecting data on kids. Yeah. There are federal COPPA regulations. Um, define what's COPPA? Oh gosh. Acronyms. Oh, Child. the acronym test. It's what. <laughs> It's something involving children and protecting them. There's a great episode of Silicon Valley all about COPPA where the guys accidentally realize that they that most of their users are kids. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. And they're suddenly... That's like that app you built, the hot dog. Yeah, hot dog, not, not hot, hot dog. dog. Yeah, yeah, not that. hot dog. <laughs> not hot dog. That's data science. That is data science. Yeah. It is. That's a neural net. That talks not about hot nets. dog. You put a lot of work into that, Matt. Yeah. I just think you've never been the same after that project <laughs> okay <laughs> not hot dog um, well to answer your question so, you, so kids yeah. data about kids right ki yeah data about specific kids. federally regulated specific health stuff like hipaa is things and i would imagine that when you're collecting things via social signals then that's just not the same yeah it's different when people are offering the data publicly through yeah. social media um, if you're talking about health records and personal health information or personally identifiable information those are things generally that we don't want to handle because it's like a hot potato it's like it, at some point right there's some sort of regulatory thing that's going to come back and bite you, you we've know? run into that a bit like just with we run into that with clients like some of the things because you know our office at full scale is over in the philippines and there there's diff specific types of clients have different kinds of needs so health anyone that hands, handles health data or anything financial Mm -hmm. is always a is always an interesting topic because you talk about re, uh, protecting that data now in some cases you can just use dummy data mm -hmm. and still be a develop you know and not even expose anybody or anything to that um right look alike data yeah. yeah yeah and and even within sort of the twitter universe or facebook universe especially since um uh oh, with the cambridge analytica you know oh, scandal, yeah. Um, with Twitter, there was a company called Geofedia that was taking those data and identifying suspects in crimes for the police uh, or identifying, you know, people that they... Sounds like Minority Report. A little bit, yeah. yeah. And so, so You're they... are guilty before the crime. And that was in violation of Twitter's terms of use, so Twitter shut them down. So Twitter shut down their, their access to the API. And I don't know what's happened since then. That was a couple of years ago. So there are, you know, without, not even at the federal level, just at each, you know, mm -hmm. if you're working with Twitter, if you're working with Facebook, there are regulations or terms of use, I should say, that you can be in violation of if you're not careful. So I'm going to guess you're a pretty close partner with Twitter on this. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've certainly have, you know, had many conversations with them to make sure that we are within their terms of use, and we are. I mean, we anonymize the data and always have. So if you look on our app or if you're trying to access our API as a business, you're never going to find any personally identifiable information about I anybody. you got to know whose Twitter handle the data came from or any of that right, kind of Right, and stuff. it's not really even necessary for what we're doing. Yeah. We just want to roll these up into the trends right. to, to create an index sort of, of, of illness that people can use to measure, you know, when they're going to trigger an ad campaign. So if, if the six score, which is what we call it, is 50 or above, that generally is going to trigger an ad campaign for, you know, Theraflu or Flonase. <laughs> so let's talk about your app for a second. Does, so the, uh, and, you know, I'm going to put it on my phone here in a bit. Does it notify me when there's something trending coming our way? Is it like, dude, watch out, Ebola is on the way? <laughs> we do. Will it tell me of the upcoming pandemic? It, it will. So what it will do, it will alert you in two different ways. It will alert you when you're in physical proximity to a recent report of illness. And then those are alert settings that you can Is change. Is that why it's buzzing in my pocket? Because yeah. I'm right yeah. next to Watson? <laughs> That's the idea. It just keeps showing your face on my phone. Yeah. It's weird. So you can say, oh, I only want to be real, uh, I only want to be notified if people have reported norovirus near me, you know, and, and you can do that with the app. And then we also have push I just did. I think you're looking at it. <laughs> Well, according to the app, it's most likely food poisoning. But Okay. Um, and then uh, we alert you when there are major headlines or public health alerts or boil alerts, you know, in your area. Boil alerts, like when they tell you to boil your water because yeah. it's been contaminated. <laughs> I found one of those like three days after. I could have really used that. <laughs> I was like, wow. Now, I, I don't think I was in the, in the, uh, the magic quadrant, as we'll say on that one, but... Yeah, I saw that there had been something local, a water main had broken, and it said boil alert, and I saw it like three days later. I'm like, cool. Yeah. That's great. I've been drinking the water and giving it to my children, bathing in it, filling up the kids' swimming pools, <laughs> you know? 
Well, and Ebola is topical right now because WHO just issued, uh, you know, an alert saying it is like an international concern now sure. again, unfortunately. Yeah. So, Graham, let me ask you, and like, and maybe I'm not trying to push buttons here. On some levels, like, where do you draw the line between, like, not also not freaking people out unnecessarily? Because, yeah. like, that's like yeah. a real thing. Like, think about that. If all of a sudden you're like, oh, shit, Ebola is here in Kansas City, like, you could, like, really cause some people to freak out like everyone's now taping their windows shut and stuff like that i mean is that is that something that you guys have like discussed or thought about or? oh absolutely it was, it was the primary concern starting out when we were just a free web app. was not was not starting like oh yeah okay and it was why cdc wasn't doing what we were doing right. it was why a lot of people weren't doing what we were doing because they were afraid to inform people in real time what was actually happening I, and, that and, I, was, and that was to prevent hysteria, right? That was what or, they thought they were right. doing. They thought they were preventing hysteria by not informing people in, in a timely manner <laughs> as to what's occurring. Even when the measles outbreak in Disneyland occurred a few years back, it took like four weeks or more for them to actually start notifying the public about that. Oh, wow. And you so, guys knew it right away? Well, we weren't tracking measles at the oh, time, okay. but I mean, if it was flu, then yes, or norovirus, yeah. You, if okay. you were a sick weather app user, you would have been alerted to that right the, away. The problem with some of these things is like norovirus is a good example. I what don't think anybody norovirus? even knows what that is. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I'm, I don't know oh, what it sorry. is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, no, so I don't. S- I've been looking at illness data for so long, I forget. Uh, norovirus <laughs> is the winter vomiting bug. <laughs> it is. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, it's usually seasonal. Um, it's the stomach flu. It's the stomach flu, but on and then steroids. there's rotavirus, too. It is when you're the projectile what? vomiting. Yeah. Do you say roto? Rotavirus, right? That's yeah. Projectile but the problem vomiting. is nobody... So how do you guys report that when there's, like, not a human in North America that even knows what that's called? And mm. to say, I have norovirus on Twitter, like, nobody's actually Well, it's because they probably went to the doctor and the doctor told them that's what they had. So that's mm-hmm. how they... So, yeah, no, there are... So we track sort of the sentiment analysis of, of people talking about these things colloquially. So they'll, they'll either refer to it as stomach virus or mm-hmm. they'll refer to it more specifically if they've been diagnosed or if they suspect it. But either way, this is sort of the f- fascinating part of what we do differently than, let's say, using clinical medical record data to, to trigger ads is that... I think that would be really slow. It's slower. Yeah. It's much slower. It takes yeah. weeks to process those right. data and get access to them. But then also, it doesn't really, under- doesn't really tell you the shopper intent. Sure. And that's what our clients care about the most, because even if someone doesn't have flu and they haven't been diagnosed, if they think they have flu, which is what we're really measuring, then they will still go to the pharmacy and buy a flu remedy. And so that's why our data has been actually more useful for forecasting sales for some of these products than, say, um, the outpatient data from a you know a urgent care clinic. So your partners that you partner with, can they come back to you and say, I want to advertise only to the people that talked about being sick? Uh, that has come up. You know, they want that one-to-one marketing capability by that user's mobile advertising ID. And that's mm-hmm. when if you, you can get, give me yeah. Watson's mobile advertising <laughs> ID, I'll, I'll, I'm a buyer. I mean, well, you guys I do any of that today? Now you're getting into like the dark arts yeah. where it's like mobile advertising and re-identification, which is a really bad word in this When, when Matt's not in town, I, go to, I just go to his house and just talk to his Google home mm. and, Sir, and Amazon Echo. That explains a few things. I, I know. I mean, yeah. yeah I mean, you, yeah. Well, well, no, and to answer your question, no, I don't know Matt Watson's mobile <laughs> advertising ID. And I shouldn't know it, you know. I no, shouldn't be able to do that. Um, so, yeah. so we've talked so much about being sick, but there's something that is always guaranteed to make you feel better, regardless of how you feel physically, and that's playing mixtape the game. <laughs> that was a good intro, wasn't it? Can I give myself some credit for that? Yeah, sure. Good segue. So anyway, mixtapethegame.com. Graham, have you played mixtape? I have not. You're about to. So big cash, big cash prizes on the line here, and the opportunity to be to f- be the first person to fire the new gold money gun, which is really just a red money gun spray gold. <laughs> and then they give you, then I had to put my own Supreme sticker on the side of it. It's totally and legit. The the fake money that goes with it looks kind of legit. It I does think they look might. Legit. I think they might be doing something else in that factory. Um, <laughs> Okay, so anyway. Can I borrow that for lunch money later? Because that looks really legit. Yep, totally. Okay. And later, when you go to jail, I have nothing to do with it. Okay. You. Okay, so I'm going to name a scenario, Graham, 
and we are all going to pick a song that we feel best fits the scenario, then we will vote. You cannot vote for yourself. The best song for a 4th of July barbecue. Hmm. Okay, I'm going with Sublime, and I can't think of the name, but it goes, Summertime in the LBC. Matt Watson's on the microphone with Matt D. Something like so that. So how about, it's kind of a lame choice, but like Brian Adams, Summer of 69. Uh, I passed over that. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of a lame choice. Yeah. Am I allowed to contribute? Yeah. Yeah, you yeah, have you're to. Playing. Uh, yeah, you're playing. Uh, yeah, you're in the game. I'm going to say, was it, I think it's called Light It Up by Fallout Boy. Is that right? I don't know if I know it. <laughs> Light it up, up, up. Yeah, I know. Oh, oh I see, I see. <laughs> I feel like no one really dominated today. I just like Sublime, and I feel like that summertime song kind of makes me want to drink 40s or something. Okay, well, we have to vote. You can't vote for yourself. I'm voting for Graham. Yeah, I am I, too. I, well, <laughs> boom. Graham. Wow. I am not going to, I do not know if this money gun is going to work well, and hang on, i got to get some video ready, because I know the people... The, on the social medias want to see it. I don't know if you need to push this down. Well, right. just give them the gun. All right, all right, okay. all right, all right. All right, who am I shooting it at? Yeah, you do whatever you want. Well, there it goes. Look at that. The wow. velocity. Look at Wow. Dude. Can I tell you a secret? I so, used to do props for MTV and Nickelodeon. Oh, wow. And this is the kind of thing they would have had me go out and find and get the fake money. Wait, this is real money. Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> can, you show the, can you show everyone the money gun? Wow. Actually, right. there you go. Yeah. It's the gold money gun. By the way, doesn't that have rain. like an amazing amount yeah. of horsepower compared to the other one? Yeah. that came, I mean, you could almost put an eye out. Um, I'm excited. And, I mean, th- and by the way... Um, after handling the cash and the money gun, you might want to give some social indication to sick weather. Maybe that's how I got sick. The money gun? <laughs> yeah. You know when they talk about laundering money? I think we need to do a different kind. We need to literally, uh, maybe we'll wash it. It, it. I know, that it's got some horsepower, right? It did. That's what I expected. Out. I mean, only with the gold money gun. Stop. You can't fire. Is there still money in it? Dude, do not break my gold money gun. There we go. It's empty. It's cool. It's okay. cool. It's cool. Don't dry fire it. That's like the like <laughs> weapons 101, man. Don't dry fire the money gun. All right. So, all right. All right. Well, Graham, congratulations. You won this round of mixtape. You can go to mixtapethegame.com. There is a digital version coming soon. We're looking forward to playing that with our listening audience, aren't you, Matt? Where I'm really you excited. will where publicly you will be shamed for trying to choose Limp Bizkit as a song. It is a song. <laughs> it is not, Matt. It is not a song. It is not. Um, so anyway, if you guys want to check out what Graham and Sickweather do, you can go to sickweather.com, download their consumer app, plug into their data, check some stuff out. Graham, are you on the Graham? Does Sickweather have an Instagram? We are, yeah. Graham on the Graham <laughs> is at Sickweather. <laughs> Sorry, too much wordplay going on there. You can check us out at, at Startup Hustle Podcast. We're going to post that video. Yeah. The golden money gun. Yeah, it's powerful. Well, I like it. I mean, it really is. Yeah. I think we need more money to put in it. I feel like we could build a cartridge on top that would like be Ooh, like an extended, yeah. like, you know, like how like the AK-47 mm-hmm. yeah, has yeah, that yeah. big curvy yes. clip. Like we need more money for yeah. the money gun. So, Do I get to keep the money? No. Um, I mean, all like 38 bucks. <laughs> yeah, you got to find it. it. That, when we did... <laughs> When we did the episode about raising capital, uh, Rachel Qualls got funded, um, and that was it. And she clearly didn't care because she left it. <laughs> so, but once again, uh, thank you for listening. Check us out at Startup, at, at Startup Hustle Podcast on Instagram. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you.